Hello, darkness, my old friend. I've come to talk with you again. So now things get a little bit more complicated, but we'll start off with a fairly simple example that proves that Neff doesn't know what he's talking about. One YouTuber commented on his video saying, Human beings have already created a synthetic cell using artificial DNA. Blah blah blah, you're an idiot, etc. Nephilim Free responded, We have not created DNA, we have created a string of nucleotides. But this does not qualify as DNA because it does not contain information. Blah blah blah, you're an idiot, etc. I think that Nephilim Free needs to realise that DNA is simply a molecule. Whether or not it contains any information is entirely incidental. In any case, here's the man who headed up the experiment in question, and Neff had better be hoping that he doesn't watch this video, otherwise there could be some pretty angry phone calls. His team synthesised, from scratch, information and all, the entire genome of Mycoplasmium genitalium, inserted it into a cell, and hey presto it grew! To prove that they had really done it themselves, they also included a series of watermarks, written in their own uniquely devised code. So what has Neff got to say next? For many years, evolutionists claimed that a considerable portion of the human DNA was what they called junk DNA. Junk. And that this uh, large portion of the DNA was non-coding for anything and didn't really contain any information. It was basically leftover junk from the process of evolution. Evolutionist biologist Kenneth Miller also called this portion of the DNA junk. He said it was full of squibbles, junk and squibbles. That's a quote. Quote, he said, junk and squibbles. Well, it was nice of him to try and include some factual information for once. Shame we didn't quite get it right. Biologists don't like the term junk DNA and prefer to talk about non-coding DNA. A few YouTube users, including Colin Mason, have pointed this out to Neff on his channel, but of course have just been blocked. But anyway, what's the point he's trying to make about junk DNA? We've discovered that this large portion of the DNA codes for proteins and performs regulatory functions that relate to other portions of the DNA molecule. In fact, it's been discovered that this portion of the DNA possess, has critical function. It's not junk at all. It's incredibly complex and critically important information storage. Oh, right, one thing at a time. We've discovered that this large portion of the DNA codes for proteins. No, it doesn't. It categorically doesn't. As soon as a stretch of DNA is found to code for something, then it's immediately no longer classed as non-coding DNA. Next and performs regulatory functions that relate to other portions of the DNA molecule. Could you be more specific? The regulatory mechanisms of DNA are well documented and relatively well understood. Oh no, I feel a patronizing analogy coming on. Let us imagine that this bar represents the human genome and that the large blue portion is its meta information, while the much smaller red portion is the genes which code for factors and define morphological structure. The information present in the genes is dependent upon this meta information in the same way the list of ingredients for a cake recipe is dependent upon the list of procedures for their combination in order to produce the cake. The ingredients list is worthless without instructions on how to utilize them, and the genes are useless without the meta information. Likewise, the meta information is dependent upon the information of the genes like the list of procedures to combine the ingredients of a cake is worthless without a list of ingredients itself. And now onto something more realistic. This is perhaps a better way to represent the human genome. Let's say that the small red portion is the actual coding material. This represents about one and a half percent of the total genome. Let's say that the blue portion are the parts of DNA which actually serve a function but are not transcribed into protein. This is between maybe one and a half and two and a half percent at best. So what then is the big yellow bit? As far as we can tell, most of the elements that make up this region are completely non-functional. This includes things like retrotransposons and short repeat sequences, the latter of which makes up about 50% of the human genome. However, Nephilim Free maintains that the Human Genome Project has established that no part of the human genome isn't critical information. Odd, because I can't find this information anywhere on their website. So if anyone would like to post me a link, I'd be very grateful. In fact, it's been discovered that this portion of the DNA possess, has critical function. Oh dear, looks like there could be more angry phone calls for Neff. This time from a team who managed to delete over 2.3 million base pairs from a mouse. 
and then showed that the mouse grew up to be happy and healthy with no observable effect on its genes. Suddenly, the idea of all this information being critical doesn't look very convincing, does it? DNA is information stored and retrieved using algorithms. I dealt with the subject of algorithms in my video Nephilim Free vs. Simple Genetics, so we'll move on. Which complies with the linguistics law. Ooh, linguistics law, what's that? Information is knowledge, which requires a sender and a receiver. Now, unless evolution were a conscience... No, hang on a minute, I want to know what linguistics law is. Can that be the parent, the father of evolution, of uh, DNA? Oh, give me a break. Because information requires a sender and a receiver, it's knowledge. Yeah, you just said that. Algorithms are uh, problem-solving procedures. And have absolutely nothing to do which with Which require DNA. the comparison of information and work to be done because of that comparison. Unless evolutionary processes, unless molecules themselves are sentient, evolutionary process cannot be the father of DNA. You've already said that bit. DNA conforms to linguistics law. Ah, here we go. Not only with its, within its sequences, but the entire molecule from one end to another. That's a truly amazing fact right there. What? That didn't explain anything. Now, only intelligent beings have linguistics capability. Unless molecules can talk, they can't be the father of... Oh, I DNA. give up. Neff certainly mentions this linguistics law a lot. He mentions it 17 times over the course of four videos. Here they all are. DNA is information stored and retrieved with algorithms which conforms to ling linguistics laws. It is embedded in overlapping with sequences, sharing base pairs or even individual nucleotides, and conforms to linguistics law. Linguistics law, which conforms to linguistics law. Linguistics law. To linguistics law. It does conform to linguistics law. Linguistics law. Off to linguistic law. Uh, linguistics law. 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 Trouble is, when I tried putting linguistics law into Google, I couldn't find anything that could relate to what you were talking about. Oh, hang on, unless you mean Zipf's law. More complex than Zipf's. Oh, so not Zipf's law then. Oh, I know where I can find it. The trustworthy encyclopedia, fans of Nephilim Free. Well, they don't seem to have heard of it either. My hunch is that he made the term up, possibly to cover his embarrassing confusion between philology and phylogeny. So how does DNA compare to linguistics? It contains grammar, syntax, and punctuation. Well, that's just artistic license. Here's the closest thing I found to an explanation. Warning, here comes another patronizing analogy. The number of nucleotides, the A, C, G, and T's, are regulated not only within the sequences, but the entire molecule from one end to another conforms to linguistics law. Now, to understand what that means, Let's imagine that you have blocks of Legos, and they come in four colors to represent A, C, G, and T. Okay. Now, now we're not talking about just the, the blocks themselves. We're also talking about the information they represent is conforms to linguistics law. Okay. But I'm going to simplify this illustration by referring only to the blocks, and let's consider them as information. Each base in DNA only represents one bit of information. They're pretty much worthless without any sequence. Okay. Now, you you lay down those blocks of different colors, but you've got a, you've got a, a problem. Let's say that you have 100 Lego blocks, okay, and they come in, in in various colors, okay, but you don't have an even number of colors, okay. You have uneven, and you are told to create a sequence of Lego blocks that is 70 blocks long, but you have uneven numbers. How are you going to do it? Well, you're going to have to do it by reducing the number of those blocks that you have the most color of and increasing the number of blocks that you have the more color of so make them even so that they conform to your prerequisite, which is to make it conform to an evenness, sort of. Okay, this is, a, this is not an exact example, but I'm just trying to convey an idea. And not doing a very good job. I think the point he's trying to get across is that Neff seems to think that in DNA there is always an exact proportion of A's, C's, G's and T's, and that proportion is always exactly even. Obviously the ratio of A's to T's and C's to G's is always 50-50, because the two couple. Not that he knew that. But the ratio of AT pairs to GC pairs is very rarely 50%. 
In humans, it's 41%, and it's been known to vary between about 20 and 80% in other organisms. But maybe I'm missing the point. Can we have a clearer explanation next time, Neff? In the third and final part of this series, I'll trawl over a creationist favourite, mutation. And if you thought linguistics law was bad, you might want to give this one a miss.